What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is December 14th of 2017. Well, folks, today I'm here to answer a question that I've been getting asked a lot about inside the Datadash community, and it's in regards to the differences of the different generations of cryptocurrencies. A lot of people have been hearing me talk about it on the Datadash channel, and a lot of you out there have also heard other people in the space talking about the continuous need for innovation in blockchain technology and these cryptocurrencies that are starting to get very highly valued in the world. So. Today I'm going to answer a lot of key factors, uh, how many generations there technically are in the broad sense of definitions uh, for cryptocurrencies, and along with that as well, what each generation brought in the sense of innovation. You know, what was the problem originally with the previous generation that needed to be resolved in the next one, and what were the innovations that were brought about to fix those certain problems, all right? So let's go ahead and dive into the video. So first and foremost, seeing as we're talking uh, about a list of generations, we got to talk about the first generation of cryptocurrencies, okay? Now, as you all can probably guess, uh, there's no doubt about it, a perfect example that we all know about in regards to the first generation of cryptocurrencies is Bitcoin. So, we all know about Bitcoin. It was the first uh, original cryptocurrency ever made back in 2009, and it has revolutionized the way we think about money. Uh, Bitcoin itself hasn't really changed all that much. It's still pretty much the same utility, uh, has the same utility that it had back in 2009. And we've made upgrades, uh, and there's been a lot of debates and, uh, you know, Discussion, uh, discussions as to where we want to take Bitcoin. But really, at the end of the day, it's it's quite simple after we really kind of factor in all the other cryptocurrency technologies that have come after. Because Bitcoin itself, with blockchain technology, is really a peer-to-peer -peer accounting system. So in very simple terms, peer-to-peer -peer allows us to make transactions. If we have peer-to-peer -peer transactions, we can make transactions between, say, Bob and Alice without the need of a third party, a centralized institution like a bank or a government or some financial processing company to get in the way of that transaction and to confirm it. It allows us to use blockchain technology to certify who has what and also make those transactions within a short matter of time and usually for lower fees as well. So, again, it's an awesome technology. It's a borderless currency and it allows us to do you know, simple transactions between one another. But notice the key term itself, simple. I really do mean that when I say it because really it's very impractical for mainstream adoption in the sense of being used as a currency. And the reason is, is because Bitcoin is quite simple. It just allows us to make peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to send someone five Bitcoin if they went to go pick me up groceries or, you know, whatever. Now, of course, in you know, the modern world, five Bitcoin's a little too much. But let's say, for example, you know, it was years ago when Bitcoin wasn't worth that much. And I wanted to pay him five Bitcoin to go pick me up groceries or do some kind of service or to execute on some form of action. Well, I can't really trust that after I send that Bitcoin, I'm going to get what I want. What if I wanted to make some type of agreement, some kind of digital contract that could make it so between myself and the other party, maybe Bob and Alice, uh, that we're making a confirmed transaction or an agreement of some sort over the blockchain? And this is what led to the second generation of cryptocurrencies. Now, for those of you who uh, keep up with Bitcoin, you've also probably heard of a very uh, another very famous cryptocurrency out there, and it's no other, of course, than Ethereum. So Ethereum is, of course, a very big cryptocurrency out in the space. And what Ethereum allows users to do is it's a little bit smarter than Bitcoin. Uh, in fact, uh, Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, wanted to actually build a lot of the functionalities of Ethereum on top of Bitcoin, but the uh, original team at Bitcoin didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep it relatively simple, keep it as a peer-to-peer -peer system. So what did Ethereum bring that was new? What's different about Ethereum? Well, the biggest thing about Ethereum is there's really two major things. First and foremost, it allows you to use a, a programming language, okay? So it allows you to use, use a code of some sort on the uh, blockchain and stuff and build both smart contracts and dApps or decentralized applications, okay? So by bringing a programming language to the blockchain, we're allowed to build these applications and smart contracts that allow us to do things much smarter than simply peer-to-peer -peer transactions. First and foremost, we have the ability to make smarter transactions and smarter agreements over the blockchain with smart contracts. 
this allows us to do a variety of things. Let's go back to our previous example. Let's say that when, uh, you know, for example, Alice was going to go pick up groceries for Bob, and Bob was going to pay, you know, five Bitcoin originally. Well, let's let's put it in the, the sense of Ethereum. Let's say that Bob wanted to pay Alice five Ethereum, uh, and there was a smart contract they wanted to execute to make sure that she's only going to receive the five Ethereum once she's done delivering the groceries. That's an example of how we can utilize smart contracts to make transactions. But this can be used for all kinds of things, such as legal disputes, um, and more advanced financial transactions, and a variety of other applications on top of the blockchain. Really endless possibilities. And along with having a programming language, as we stated, we can build decentralized applications. This allows us to build applications on top of the blockchain and use a, a backend style of development to build these applications in a variety of different languages. Now, depending on what uh, blockchain you're using, different uh, networks have different languages that they support. So Ethereum supports a few different ones, and there's also different competitors in the space that offer different ones. Things like this would be like Neo, for example, that uh, has different language sets than Ethereum, and you can find dozens of other ones that have competed to be this real, uh, almost kind of enterprise solution, allowing people to build these decentralized applications or make smarter transactions with smart contracts, okay? So we have first generation, uh, which uh, allowed us to do simple peer-to-peer -peer transactions, and second generation that allowed us to use programming languages to build decentralized applications as well as smart contracts. So we've definitely seen a lot of innovation in this space, and this has allowed us to really start seeing the potential of blockchain technology as well as other decentralized methodologies um, to uh, build these networks that don't need central authority. However, at the same time, as we're fighting against the idea of central authority with blockchain and other decentralized applications, there's still an issue with first and second generation cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, as well as Ethereum, have terrible governance systems. If you think about it, we can go back and uh, think about a few examples. First and foremost, Bitcoin itself has a lot of issues in the sense of scalability. Uh, this is in the regards to the amount of transactions that can be processed and scaling the network because with each block on the blockchain and every node on that network having a copy of that blockchain, if we increase the block size of the blockchain, uh, the network is going to get very uh, heavy in the sense of data, keeping all that prior transaction history. Not to mention Bitcoin can only process three transactions a second right now. So the fixes that are coming for that are coming very slow and are very, I would say, very drama based. And because of that, nothing's really getting done. It doesn't have a good system of governance because the uh, evolutions for Bitcoin, the forks for Bitcoin are determined by the miners the people who mine Bitcoin. And it doesn't allow us to start with a community consensus in some regard. Same with Ethereum as well. Ethereum has uh, very high power figures in regards to the developers like Vitalik, who during the DAO hack led the effort uh, to roll back the blockchain in regards to uh, the DAO hack that led to millions of dollars worth of Ethereum getting stolen. Now, I think we could all agree that that was a good move to roll back the blockchain. The problem that arises then in the fact that it was created, uh, that decision was really made by a central authority. And blockchain being decentralized shouldn't have that. So this has led us to the need for a third generation of blockchain technology. Okay, and really third generation cryptocurrency. Now, we don't have an exact example here yet. There's a lot competing in the space uh, trying to be third generation cryptocurrency. Some of them are coming on the horizon right now. We see projects like Cardano and various others who are trying to build what both of these do not have, and that is a system of governance. All right. So I'll just do Gov for short there. But a system of governance, a system where we can make decisions on more of a, a community-based level and really get consensus on where we want to take this cryptocurrency in the future. Because there's still a lot of issues with both of these. One that we already listed was scalability. So we need to make sure that the blockchain or whatever technology we're using under the hood for these cryptocurrencies can scale. This is a very big issue right now. Bitcoin can only process three, transa three to four transactions a second, and we know that Ethereum can only process a little more than a dozen transactions. You know, a few, uh, uh, it's still double digits. And really, if we think of the scalability of uh, demanded transactions in the world, if we think about Visa and MasterCard and just financial transactions alone, that's thousands of transactions per second that need to be processed. So. We need to have a governance system that can help us scale, uh, can help with uh, interoperability, okay? So interoperability is a fancy uh, term 
Uh, interoperability is really a fancy term in regards to being able to interact with other blockchains, to interact with other cryptocurrencies, and to make exchanges uh, along with one another. So if we can't have interoperability, seeing as there's going to be you know thousands of cryptocurrencies, uh, third generation cryptocurrencies wouldn't be that effective. But third generation is going to be able to communicate with other different cryptocurrencies in different networks. And that's really what comes with the whole third generation of being a smarter currency. So last and not least, of course, uh, is really sustainability. Uh, and that's what comes with the governance system, first and foremost. Having a governance system is really the major factor. If we were to take a look back here, you know, at the major innovations that each brought. First generation brought peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network transactions between one another without, without needing a third party. The second generation really brought about the use of programming languages on the top of the blockchain with the implementation of smart contracts and decentralized apps. And the third one was a system of governance, which allowed scale and interoperability. All right. So this is a very, very brief summary, but it shows that we are making some serious strides in innovating cryptocurrencies. And like I said, there are some projects out there that are going for this third generation right now. It's not completely in full fruition. And as we know, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds to thousands of cryptocurrencies that meet in the first and second generation. So these are just a few simple examples and very broad. It's very much brought down into a very simple, easy to understand explanation. So anyways, I hope this video helped you all out and helps answer that question, uh, help to answer that question. If you all do have any comments, questions or concerns, please leave it down below in the comments and I will try to get back to it if I can. If not, hopefully other people in the community will help to answer. But anyways, that's it for the video, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.